Uh, so I've been requested to uh, discuss the surgical management of breast cancer. It's quite extensive because we have to cover mastectomy, breast conservation, uh, write a little bit about reconstruction following uh, MRM because uh, that is important from the <laughs> point of view, uh, view. A little bit about oncoplasty and then we move on to management of the axilla. All right. So uh, just a minute. This is Right. Okay. So uh, coming to the natural history of breast cancer, there have been various theories which have been uh, put forth to explain the course of the disease since uh, more than a century ago. The first theory was the Halstedian theory, which was coined by uh, William Halstead in 1894, followed by the alternative therapy or by Fisher, and uh, more recently, Hellman spectrum theory, which we all follow now. The Halstead theory is a theory of contiguous development of MET. So by, by this, what Halstead meant was uh, the tumor arises in one location, say that is the breast, and from there it spreads by lymphatic spread to the lymph nodes and then to the rest of the body. So this uh, theory was followed for uh, more than a century uh, until uh, the mid 20th century when Dr. Bernard Fisher from the United States of America, he disagreed. So uh, he thought and uh, he, he explained that breast cancer was a systemic disease. So according to him, any distant metastasis that would, um, uh, so according to him, uh, at the time of, uh, uh, you know, uh, if uh, at the time of detection of a palpable breast lump, or uh, if it's seen in a screening mammogram, what he said is any distant metastasis would have already occurred at the time. So according to his theory, uh, it would mean that there is not much significance attributed to local regional treatment and that breast cancer was a systemic disease. So it had to be uh, treated by systemic means that is chemotherapy or uh, hormonal therapy. So in 1994, during a Karnofsky lecture, Dr. Hellman, he coined the spectrum theory, which was a combination of the two. So what Hellman said, was that uh, the breast cancer, the primary would evolve in the organ and from there on, if left untreated, then it would spread via the lymphatics to the lymph node and then to the rest of the body. Why did he coin this theory? Because there were so many studies that showed a survival benefit from radiation, which could not be explained by only the systemic theory, right? So according to his theory, timely local regional treatment is very important. Now coming to uh, the modes of surgical management, uh, we can discuss the options of treatment with the patients for primary operable breast cancer, right? So the patient can either opt for a, a mastectomy or opt for breast conservation. Now mastectomy is something that has been practiced since a very long time, but the technique has evolved. So initially when uh, they had, uh, started out uh, with mastectomy, the technique was more radical, right? It was, uh, there was, uh, you know, they would uh, excise the breast and the lymph nodes and the muscles. Uh, it was a very radical, very morbid procedure. So I'm just going to go through the history briefly, right? So the earliest reports of breast cancer came from Egyptian papyri. And the oldest of these papyri was the Edwin Smith papyrus wherein they had described that breast cancer was a disease for which there was no cure. And they used to cauterize the breast tumors at that time. And then a few years later in first century AD, there was a surgeon named Leonidas who said that, you know, maybe we can alternate cautery with, an, with incision as well. And of course, there were a lot more surgeons after that who kept proposing different theories and different techniques and the technique of mastectomy evolved. Uh, the first report of the radical mastectomy is attributed to a French surgeon, Bernard. However, William Stuart Halstead performed the first clearly documented radical mastectomy at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And this is an illustration from Halstead demonstrating the technique. So now radical mastectomy has evolved 
and uh, we have with uh, more evidence coming in uh, we have adopted more conservative approaches of treatment uh, so now uh, from radical mastectomy we're doing modified radical mastectomy and we also have conservative mastectomies which have developed in the uh, early 20th century 20 yeah 20th century Right, so I'm just going to tell you a little uh, bit about the various techniques in MRM, the Petis technique, Scanlon's technique, and the Auchincloss technique. Uh, am I audible? I think there's a problem with my video. You are audible. Okay. So uh, the modified radical mastectomy was described uh, by Petey. Petey's technique is wherein we excise the breast tissue, the uh, overlying skin, the nipple areola complex, the pectoralis uh, and the pectoralis minor muscle. So in a radical mastectomy, we would also excise the pectoralis major, the minor muscle and the axillary lymph nodes. Whereas in the Petey's technique, we would preserve the pectoralis major muscle. The Scanlon's technique is what is most often practiced in our country, wherein the pectoralis minor muscle is retracted upwards to gain access to the level three axillary lymph nodes, which are resected. And the Auchincloss technique is one where the pectoralis minor muscle is not disturbed and we only uh, dissect the level one and level two axillary lymph nodes. So uh, the evidence uh, which allowed us to move from a radical mastectomy to a more conservative modified radical mastectomy was uh, the NSABP04 trial by Burnett Fisher's team, wherein they compared radical mastectomy with total mastectomy and axillary radiation. And the third group was uh, only total mastectomy without any axillary intervention. And this was conducted in a population of clinically node negative women with breast cancer. And the 25 year follow up of this study showed that there was no difference in overall survival in any of the, uh, in either of the groups. Right? So that, and there was, um, and the group which did not receive uh, radiation, more than half of them did. Uh, develop axillary mets uh, on follow-up, but that did not impa have any impact on the survival. So which proved that uh, we didn't need to be so radical in our approach and we could, uh, and that's how uh, we uh, modified radical mastectomy came into practice. So what are the indications for a mastectomy? This table is directly from the European textbook of uh, breast cancer management, the surgeons. Uh, the indications are any disease that is extensive, extensive microcalcifications, extensive in situ disease, which is not amenable to breast conserving surgery. Uh, patients who've already been treated, who've undergone a breast conserving surgery in the past and now present with a second ipsilateral uh, uh, you know, tumor in the breast. However, this is a relative indication. Patient choice, of course. Uh, prophylactic risk reduction surgery in those with a, you know, a significant family history of breast cancer, BRCA positive patients, patients with the P53 mutation. Another relative indication is uh, LABC, locally advanced breast cancers. Inflammatory breast cancer is an absolute indication. There is no role for conservation there. And of course, patients who uh, receive mantle radiotherapy for Hodgkin's cannot be considered for breast, uh, for a mastectomy. I mean, will be considered for mistake. I'm sorry. So I'm just going to show you uh, a video of, uh, that I managed to get, and I'm very, very thankful to Dr. Geeta, uh, who's a senior consultant breast surgeon at Max Hospital, who was kind enough to lend me this video. I didn't have one myself. Okay, so uh, first is um, the marking, right? Uh, this is the, the lump, the tumor is in the upper outer quadrant. So what we're going to do first is to mark a line at the midpoint um, of the chest, that is along the sternum, and another line along the anterior axillary 
line. And what she has done, if you see, she's actually marked, I'll just show you when, uh, okay. So let me pause this, right. So if you see where the sketch pen is, she's marked a point there. That is around two centimeters or two finger breadths away from the midline. This is because while raising the flaps, we must ensure that we don't cross the midline. So you mark, uh, you mark that as your border and you take a corresponding a point along the line of the nipple areolar complex at the anterior axillary line. And then you've already seen how she joined those two lines to mark the upper border. She pulled the breast down, mark the upper border. Similarly for the lower border, she pulls the breast up, pushes the breast up and marks the lower border. Then we uh, take, make an incision along the line marked and we raise the upper and the lower flaps. The upper flap is raised all the way down until we can feel the clavicle, though that is not compulsory these days. The lower flap is uh, raised all the way down to the inframammary crease. So the plane that we take while raising the flap Right, we have to keep checking for the thickness. So this is an avascular plane. This is between the subcutaneous tissue and the breast tissue, right? And this plane is, um, if we're going uh, in the right plane, it will be avascular, minimal amount of bleeding. So you can see uh, as we're raising it superior medially, we also ensure that we don't um, cross the midline. Laterally, the flap is raised all the way to the anterior border of the latissimus dorsi muscle. Okay, I'm just going to move this along a bit. This is laterally, uh, they're dissecting it a lot um, up to the anterior border of the LD muscle. Following this, the breast tissue can be lifted off the chest wall, right? So this is where the breast tissue is being lifted off the pectoralis major muscle along with the pectoral fascia. And once the breast is completely off the chest wall, we enter uh, into the axilla and start the axillary dissection. So if here, if you can see, uh, there's an incision that is being made at the lateral border of the pectoralis major muscle that is being retracted. And uh, we're opening up the clavipectoral fascia uh, which will uh, gain us uh, in, uh, entrance into the axilla. You see the axillary vein, so that is an important landmark. We must ensure that uh, that is safe and sound. Right? And one centimeter below the axillary vein is your intercostobrachial nerve. So this is responsible for sensory supply on the lateral aspect of the chest and the medial aspect of the arm. Uh, more often than not, during a modified radical mastectomy, uh, you won't be wrong in, uh, uh, in uh, cutting the intercostobrachial uh, nerve, but uh, there's immense amount of benefit in case you do manage to preserve the no, uh, nerve. So uh, the side effects or the complications of mastectomy that include loss of sensation, numbness, you know, pricking pains, uh, all the, the patient won't complain of uh, the same. So uh, this is the level one axillary dissection. She's dissecting the interneural tissue now. I'll just show you. Uh, yes, this, so what's important? Uh, uh, so what we have to keep in mind during an axillary dissection is that we uh, must uh, conserve the nerve to serratus anterior. Uh, can you see my cursor? Yes, ma'am, visible. Right. So this is the nerve to serratus anterior. This has to be preserved, and so does and so does the LD pedicle, the latissimus dorsi pedicle, the vein, the uh, and the artery. They need to be preserved. Right. So uh, cutting of the nerve to serratus will result in uh, winging of the scapula. So what she's done is dissected the tissue between this. So the uh, axillary, the axillary fat, and the nodal tissue that exists exists in this triangle is the level one axilla. So once this dissection is done, the breast can be removed along with the level one nodal tissue. Right? So that's what she's doing. 
they're separating the uh, level one axillary tissue from the breast. And then we move on to level two dissection, right? So the tissue is being pulled off from beneath the pectoralis minor muscle. It's right below the pectoralis minor muscle and that is being dissected out. This is the level two uh, following which uh, the pectoralis minor muscle has to be retracted to gain access to level three. At all times, we must ensure that we remain below the axillary vein. That is your upper limit. Uh, few centers also dissect the interpectoral tissue. That is, they expose the plane between the pectoralis major and the minor muscle and dissect out that tissue. And through that plane as well, the level three axillary tissue can be uh, accessed. So I'm going to show you that, right? So this is the uh, interpectoral plane and the interpectoral tissue is being dissected out. Okay, so once all this is done, your uh, procedure is complete. You give a nice good wash and the wound is closed in layers. We uh, put in two drains, one to drain uh, the chest wall and another one into the axilla. Okay, so right, end of movie time. Right. The complications of the procedure are bleeding in 3% of the cases could be the reactionary or secondary hemorrhage, uh, prolonged seroma and various complications related to axillary dissection, such as uh, shoulder dysfunction, uh, numbness along uh, the lateral aspect of the chest, the medial aspect of the arm, a little bit of the back, lymphedema, right? So we will come to that a bit later when we discuss uh, uh, axillary dissection. Now, 19, in the early 90s, 1991, if I'm not wrong, uh, they started describing more conservative techniques of mastectomy, such as skin sparing mastectomy, nipple sparing mastectomy. So the skin sparing mastectomy is similar to uh, what the procedure that you've just seen, just that the ellipse that, is, uh, that was taken for a modified radical mastectomy was that wide. So you just reduce the width. Right, and you just take a little bit of the skin. Um, you, the incision is around the nipple areolar complex, but a uh, very lit, less amount of skin is excised so as to retain that skin envelope. And uh, there is evidence to show that uh, the rates of local recurrence following a skin sparing mastectomy is comparable to that of a conventional mastectomy. Now, a lot of uh, mastectomy specimens, there was a study where, uh, you know, uh, mastectomy specimens were uh, examined and they found that in five to 58% of the cases, there was occult disease in the nipple, even if the primary disease was around four to five centimeters away from the nipple. So that's, and uh, certain, and a little bit of tissue has to be left behind, uh, behind the nipple areola complex to retain the vascularity so that uh, it does not undergo necrosis. Hence in a skin sparing mastectomy, we excise the nipple areola complex as well. But when we consider a nipple sparing mastectomy, uh, what, we, uh, what one can do is uh, probably take a little bit of the tissue that is just posterior to the nipple areola complex and send it for an intraoperative frozen section to ensure that there is no invasive or in situ disease. Uh, so how we can, uh, so what's important in this when we consider a conservative mastectomy is appropriate patient selection. So we must ensure that we select patients with relatively uh, small uh, disease, like, you know, probably less than three centimeters in size, uh, more laterally situated, you know, away from the nipple areola complex. So that is very important. Right. So now that you have offered the patient uh, a mastectomy or now that the patient has opted for a mastectomy, it is all the more important that we offer her uh, a reconstruction. Right. And in case the patient does want reconstruction, there are various considerations that we need to keep in mind. First of all, the timing of reconstruction. Should it be immediate? Should it be delayed or should it be delayed immediate? Secondly, what kind of reconstruction do you want to consider? Do you want to use an implant? Do you want to use the patient's autologous tissue, right? So all of these have various, um, right. So 
uh, now there certain surgeons argue uh, for an immediate reconstruction right so uh, they say that it avoids the need for a second major operative procedure and also the patient is avoided the psychological morbidity that uh, she may have on uh, when she loses the breast now what are the techniques that we can use for reconstruction one can either use an implant the implant placement uh, can also be done in a two stage procedure wherein we place uh, the tissue expander first uh, followed by a replacement with an implant again when is this uh, you know expander implant exchange done that also matters the timing of that should we do it prior to adjuvant rt should it be done um, after adjuvant rt or should we consider myocutaneous tissue flaps right implant reconstructions are preferable in those women who are small built who have small to moderate sized breasts with very minimal ptosis larger women obese women with grade 2 grade 3 ptosis it's preferable to consider autologous reconstructions right because uh, when we uh, there are only certain sizes there is a limit to the size of the implant that one can get uh, that uh, one gets i think uh, in the uh, us i think uh, the maximum size is around uh, 850 ml uh, but i'm i'm not sure right and uh, there are reports uh, that uh, say that the long term satisfaction is also higher with an autologous reconstruction but of course these procedures are very extensive it's very time consuming and uh, we must keep in uh, uh, you know we must be aware that uh, Uh, we can have donor site complications as well so the re our reconstruction choices are also influenced by whether adjuvant rt is required or not because uh, in immediate reconstruction say by using an implant that can impact the delivery of radiation right so uh, and i think the radiation oncologist in the group will probably be able to explain this better but it is difficult it might be difficult to maintain dose homogeneity also there is a higher risk of higher exposure of uh, the uh, you know the heart and the lung uh, to radiation but this is not impossible uh, centers of excellence have said that we can still consider uh, rt uh, post a, a re implant reconstruction but it would require uh, greater planning right and it would require a lot more diligence and uh, it's complicated challenging as well uh but another thing that we need to keep in mind is that radiotherapy can also impact the outcome of reconstruction we can have skin changes there can be vascular compromise there can be uh, fibrosis it can um, affect the viability of the flap it affects cosmesis as well so the optimal timing of reconstruction is very important uh so i had mentioned initially about the two stage uh uh two stage procedure of implant uh, insertion that is wherein we put in the expander at the time of mastectomy you inflate it uh, during the chemo you keep inflating it and then once the desired uh, expansion has been achieved we can replace the expander with um the implant either prior to rt or uh, after rt uh the most um, uh, the most common complication that is associated uh with rt uh, you know with radiation to an implant is capsular contracture that can occur uh so the most preferable uh, option for a reconstruction is autologous reconstruction it's preferable if uh, the patient opts for it after adjuvant therapy so once treatment is completed probably one year after rt once the skin settled uh, settles down uh, it's better to plan the uh, reconstruction and the full cosmetic impact of the radiation and the reconstruction may not be evident until 3 years after treatment right so this is a table it's uh, directly from devita wherein they've just mentioned the different kinds of reconstructive options its advantages disadvantages etc so from a radical mastectomy we've come to modified radical mastectomy and then we've come to an even more conservative technique breast conservation right where it's possible to preserve a cosmetically acceptable breast without compromising the local tumor control and more often than not when we uh, 
when we present the patient with an option of breast conservation, it's breast conservation therapy, that is breast conservation surgery with RT, so that the survival that is provided is equivalent to that of the mastectomy. So this is one of the most important developments in surgical oncology over the last 25 years, and this is mainly uh, attributed to these two men, uh, Dr. Umberto Veronesi from Milan and uh, Dr. Bernard Fisher from the United States of America. He actually just passed away just a few months ago, last year in October, interestingly. So Bernard Fisher's team, he, uh, they presented uh, the 20-year follow-up of a randomized control trial, the NSABP06 trial, wherein they compare total mastectomy with lumpectomy and lumpectomy plus irradiation. So if you can see in the image here, it's very clearly seen that the um, incidence of local recurrence is much higher in the lumpectomy only group rather than the lumpectomy plus irradiation, right? And the difference uh, that is 30, 40%, close to 40% in, in the group without irradiation and uh, the incidence reduces to 14% in those uh, who've received irradiation. And this is a very significant difference. However, there was no difference in the overall survival amongst the women who underwent mastectomy and lumpectomy with or without irradiation, right? Also, to substantiate this, Veronese's team came up with the Milan trial, right? Wherein they presented the results it, of uh, a randomized study wherein they uh, compared breast conservation surgery with radical mastectomy. Uh, yes, there is a higher incidence, slightly higher incidence of local recurrence in those who've undergone breast conservation therapy in this study compared to radical mastectomy. But this was in the very early stages, um, around the early 90s, uh, when uh, we did not have a consensus about the margins that, uh, the, uh, margins that needed to be taken. However, they saw in this trial that there was no difference in the long-term survival rate, right? Between BCS as well, BCT, as well as radical mastectomy. So they concluded that breast conservation surgery is a treatment of choice for women who present with relatively early disease. Now, why should we offer the patient conservation? It has, for one, it has a very positive impact on the patient's well-being. Patient um, has an improved body image, improved sexual life, um, so that improves their quality of life as well. And as we can see from the evidence, it, is, it achieves long-term survival equivalent to that of a mastectomy. So why not, right? So when we plan a breast conservation surgery, these are the few things that we must keep in mind. Consider it a checklist, right? The size, the extent of the lesion, the location of the lesion. If the lesion, the breast tumor ratio, so the size of the breast, the size of the lesion with respect to that of the breast, can we just do a breast conservation surgery or do we need to consider alternate methods of uh, closure, maybe plastic surgery techniques, oncoplasty, right? The density of the breast, is it a very dense breast or is it a very fatty breast? Because that has an implication when we are operating, right? Uh, that also has an implication when we're performing oncoplasty. It gives us information about uh, exactly how much of the parenchyma can we uh, mobilize in a very fatty breast. If one uh, does too much of mobilization and plays around with uh, the fat inside, uh, it can result in fat necrosis. Again, whether, uh, if there is ptosis, the biology of the tumor is again very important because that gives us information about uh, the, uh, you know, the chances of uh, local recurrence, uh, previous surgeries, any contraindications for RT, has she suffered from Hodgkin's lymphoma in the past? Has she received radiation in the past? Has she received breast conserving treatment in the past, right? Other comorbidities, her build, whether she's obese, is she a smoker? Because that ha will have an impact on uh, wound healing. And also in case we plan an oncoplasty, it has a tremendous impact on the well-being of the flap as well. So I'm uh, moving on to the contraindications of BCS. This is directly from uh, the NCCN, this, these are the NCCN guidelines, right? So they say the absolute contraindications include radiation therapy during pregnancy, right? Uh, breast wherein, uh, disease where there is um, diffuse 
microcalcifications. Widespread disease that cannot be encompassed by a breast conserving surgery, then we have to go ahead with a mastectomy. If we cannot get uh, negative margins, Relative contraindications uh, are again patients who've undergone, uh, who've received RT prior. So that's, that was an absolute contraindication, but uh, now not so. Uh, there's a lot of work that's going on in this area. Um, so in case a patient has received RT in the past, uh, we'll have to find out, uh, you know, how long ago did she receive RT? How much of uh, radiation? What is the dose that she has received? And according to that, we can tailor her present treatment and see if we can offer her breast conserving, uh, conservation surgery, uh, surgery again. Patients with active connective tissue disorders like scleroderma lupus, a tumor is more than five centimeters, a relative contraindication because what I mentioned, uh, like I mentioned earlier, what's important is the breast tumor ratio. Positive pathological margins, and uh, women with, uh, you know, uh, who are BRCA positive, suspected genetic uh, predisposition to breast cancer, uh, this is a relative contraindication. It used to be an absolute contraindication, but now it's a relative contraindication. So breast conserving uh, BCT is not contraindicated in them. But yes, they do have a very high chance of, uh, you know, getting a second cancer, second primary, or having a local recurrence. So when, uh, so breast conservation surgery, right? So what we need to keep in mind uh, on table, right? do you need to, should we do a lumpectomy or a wide local excision? Both can be done. How much of tissue should one remove, right? Should we just remove the lump that is a lumpectomy or should, uh, or should we uh, include the overlying skin, the underlying tissue, a little bit, the, the lesion, and go all the way down to the muscle and excise the pectoral fascia as well. So both can be done. Uh, what's important uh, to, uh, what we must ensure uh, during, uh, uh, during excision is that margins are negative, right? Margins are absolutely essential. So uh, what do you mean by the adequate margins? Uh, according to the ASCO CAP guidelines, uh, they have said, no tumor on ink as an adequate margin, right? So your inked margin should have no tumor. Again, this is a very controversial area. Some, at some centers, they prefer wider margins. Um, you know, some people say one centimeter, some people say five centimeters. But then again, studies have shown us that wider margins don't necessarily mean a lower risk of local regional recurrence. There's no evidence for the same. So as for now, the guideline, uh, universal guideline says that no tumor on ink should be uh, our aim. Uh, once the wide local excision has been done, the specimen is oriented, right? Everybody has a standard way of marking the specimen. We'll mark the lateral border, the superior border. In case the skin has not been excised, we mark the anterior border as well. And this specimen uh, may be sent for an intraoperative frozen section to ensure that the margins are negative. Uh, in certain countries like the UK, uh, they don't have frozen section available. So they just do a wide local excision and they wait for the results of the histopathology to decide whether they need to go back in and revise the margins. Once the wide local excision has been done and the specimen has been sent, the base, that, uh, the base has to be marked with clips. This is very uh, important for, uh, this will be a marker when we want to deliver post-operative uh, radiation, right? To deliver the boost. Uh, then coming to the cavity closure, earlier the lumpectomy cavity used to be left open. So they used to just, you know, close the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, wait for seroma to fill the cavity. And, you know, that gives a very beautiful, um, cosmetically it looks, it gives a very good breast contour. But then they did realize that once the seroma was resorbed or post RT when uh, fibrosis occurred, the cosmesis was uh, greatly impaired. So now, uh, so now it is uh, preferable that we close the cavity. You know, we bring the breast parenchyma together, uh, mobilize if required, you know, do an, a level one oncoplasty, bring the parenchyma together, close it in layers so that the contour is maintained. So as I mentioned, uh, 
delivery of adjuvant uh, whole breast radiotherapy is absolutely essential following a breast conserving, uh, conservation surgery to reduce uh, the local uh, recurrence, right? In, uh, and also, uh, one can give 10 to 15 gray boost to the uh, base of the tumor to reduce the local recurrence. There are many centers in the West that do not uh, give a boost to the axilla. Uh, so I've, am I audible? Because I think I've lost. Yes. Okay, great, fine. So uh, in many centers in the uh, West, the, uh, they do away with the boost. They don't uh, boost the base because they uh, are provide, I mean, they usually see very early cancers. Uh, there was an EORTC trial wherein uh, there was evidence to show that delivery of uh, post-operative boost to the base of the tumor decreased the rate of uh, local recurrence by 41%, but the absolute benefit was only 2%. Uh, was only, uh, yeah, was only 2%. So many centers in the West, they do away with it. Right. So uh, what is oncoplasty? I, I mentioned level one oncoplasty, right? So what is oncoplasty? It's basically a, a technique, um, right? It's, it, it, which accompanies breast conservation surgery. So wherein we excise the primary tumor, maintaining oncological safety, uh, oncological safety, and we reconstruct the defect using principles of plastic surgery, such as volume displacement techniques, volume replacement techniques with flaps, et cetera, and also uh, perform contralateral symmetry surgery if required, right? So this helps uh, to improve the cosmetic outcomes after breast conservation and radiation as well. Uh, oncoplasty is usually considered if uh, more than 20% of the breast tissue uh, needs to be excised. Uh, during a breast conservation. Okay, so just a brief, so act, um, before we move ahead to management of the axilla, let me just tell you. So oncoplasty, you have level one, level two, level three. Now level one is oncoplasty is, uh, you know, basically just the, uh, the, once the tumor is removed, we try to bring the cavity, uh, we try to bring uh, the walls of the breast parenchyma together. It may involve uh, mobilization. It may, uh, we may require to do uniplanar mobilization. We may require to do a biplanar mobilization. Uh, the aim is to bring the pillars together such that co adequate cosmesis is maintained, right? Uh, and we may also need to re uh, reposition the nipple areal complex at such a time. Now, volume displacement and volume replacement techniques uh, are level two and level three uh, techniques of oncoplasty, and these are a lot more advanced. So when we uh, do consider level two, level three oncoplasties, what's important is that after excision, there'll be a lot of, you know, a rearrangement of the tissue or the tissue bed. So before we go ahead with all that, uh, we must mark the base of the tumor for post-op RT and the boost. Right. So the last segment, management of uh, the axilla. Okay. So just like uh, you know, management of uh, the surgical options for the breast was very radical. So standard since uh, ages, a complete axillary lymph node dissection was routine. But this perception changed following the results of the NACBP04 trial. Right. So why did that happen? Because we had uh, three arms in that, the radical mastectomy arm, the um, group of patients who underwent a uh, total mastectomy with axillary radiation, and the third group wherein they only underwent a total mastectomy. And this population of patients were clinically node negative. So axillary lymph nodal dissection in this group of patients did not show any survival benefit in this population. And there was a group of patients uh, who were uh, axillary node negative, more than half of them did uh, uh, become axillary nodal positive during follow-up. However, that did not impact survival, right? So because of that, uh, I think I've paused. Hello? 
you are audible now okay great i'm i'm just facing a few network issues okay so since axillary lymph nodal dissection did not show survival benefit in node negative disease um it made surgeons wonder uh can we come up with conservative techniques uh for management of the axilla because axillary nodal uh dissection uh involves uh, there's there's a lot more morbidity that's associated with it so can we consider conservative techniques like say sentinel lymph node biopsy which was described in uh, treatment of malignant melanoma penile cancers in uh, parotid cancers okay so what is a sentinel lymph node the sentinel lymph node is the first echelon node right it's the first tier node it's also known as the gatekeeper so it's the first node that drains the primary tumor so the tumor uh, the the disease spreads from the primary along the lymphatic pathways and reaches that first node so that node is known as a sentinel lymph node so uh, the theory behind this was to use a tracer which would travel from the primary to this first draining lymph node uh, which can then be identified and evaluated if positive or not and uh, further treatment could be done right so what is the evidence for uh, sentinel lymph node uh, uh biopsy uh, being considered in the treatment of ca breast so for this you had the nsabp 32 b32 trial uh, wherein they compared patients uh, again clinically node negative patients with breast cancer uh <laughs> all right so just tell me uh in case i'm not audible because i think I've lost electricity right so clinically node uh, negative patients with uh, right they compared sentinel lymph node resection with conventional axillary lymph node dissection and uh, this trial right showed us that there was no difference in the survival the overall survival disease free survival they were all equivalent in the group of patients who were sentinel lymph node negative as well as those who had a completion axillary lymph node dissection moreover the sentinel the group of patients who underwent the sentinel lymph node dissection the the morbidity was uh, much less so coming to the methods right so prior to surgery we uh, the morning of the surgery a radioactive tracer more often than not it's technetium 99 is injected Uh, either intradermal subdermal either subcutaneous sub areola it can be injected peritumoral right the various ways uh, to inject the dye so this is injected the morning before surgery it can also be injected in the night before surgery so accordingly we'll have to uh, change the dose of the uh, uh, tracer so the recommended uh, amount is 40 to 60 megabecquerel and uh, of course if uh, we can uh, go a bit higher if we are injecting it the night prior to surgery okay and uh, it's preferable to inject the dye more superficially because that makes the dye spread faster deeper injections may result in us uh, identifying extra axillary lymph nodes such as the parasternal nodes uh, etc but we don't have any substantial evidence on uh, uh you know if uh, dissection of these nodes or this treatment targeting these nodes uh, prolongs survival okay so on table when the patient comes on table patient is painted draped uh what we do is we inject whitey blue dye so we use methylene blue dye it is again injected either peri areola or can be uh, injected peri tumoral intradermal subdermal right Uh, so 0.5 to 5 ml of the dye is injected uh, we use two dyes that is we use a radio tracer dye as well as the blue dye in order to reduce our rates of false negativity so once this dye is injected it is massaged into the tumor and then uh, into the skin and the incision is taken either at the lower end of the hairline or at the point of maximum detection of radio tracer activity by using a probe so once we detect uh, the uh, 
the point of maximum radio trace activity, that's where the incision is taken, and the sentinel lymph node is excised. So what, how many nodes should we excise when doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy? So we must excise the node which shows the maximum radio tracer reading and also surrounding nodes that do show some uptake, right? Or at least 10% of the radioactivity as a sentinel node. We must excise uh, nodes with uptake of blue dye and also any other enlarged, hard, clinically significant nodes because um, axillary nodes, when, if there is a macro metast uh, metastatic deposit, that may prevent the node from taking up the dye. Okay, so this is a very nice diagram that I came across wherein uh, they've uh, shown which, which are the most probable locations for one to, for the surgeon to find the node. So more often than not, it's found immediately uh, lateral to the chest wall, right? And um, the uh, chance of probability of finding a sentinel node decreases as we go laterally. These nodes, once they're excised, they're sent for intraoperative uh, frozen section and we wait for the report. So if the nodes are positive, then we go ahead with an axillary lymph node dissection, right? Uh, there are many, a uh, few centers now who do not opt for uh, an intraop frozen section in the West, especially um, uh, after uh, emergence of data from the Akazog Z11 trial. Okay, because uh, that gave us data saying that we can avoid axillary lymph node dissection even in the presence of one to two positive lymph nodes. So we will be discussing that now, right? So the Akasog group, the Akasog Z11 trial, they examined patients uh, who underwent uh, a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And uh, after that, they were uh, patients with positive sentinel lymph nodes they were randomized to undergo further axillary lymph node dissection versus no further treatment. And once again, after 6.3 years of follow-up, the results of this trial, uh, it replicated the results of the NACBP04 trial, right? Wherein in, that, in the NACBP04, more than 38% of uh, patients with axillary dissection, they had nodal mets. But in the untreated axilla, less than half of them ended up developing an axillary recurrence. So they have hypothesized that probably not all axillary mets do progress to become clinically evident. So in such cases, in, clinic, in clinically node negative tumors, early disease, we probably don't need to address um, the axilla. So that's what they concluded that local regional control in patients with low to moderate axillary tumor burden treated with breast conserving therapy and adjuvant systemic therapy may not be improved by uh, an axillary lymph node dissection. But there are a lot of pitfalls to this study, so it's very controversial. So we don't know if this can, uh, you know, it's controversial if we can just take it uh, at face value and utilize it in our setting. Because first of all, the trial was very underpowered. They did not uh, reach accrual. Uh, secondly, the patients who were randomized uh, they were highly selected. So they were only patients with very early disease with extremely low nodal burden who were randomized. So any patient who had three or more positive sentinel lymph node biopsy, uh, sentinel lymph nodes were not even randomized. They were not even taken um, as part of the trial. Uh, they underwent an axillary lymph node dissection. So this is a highly selective population. On top of that, uh, none of the patients in the trial underwent a mastectomy. They were only patients who underwent breast conservation therapy. So all of them received whole breast radio, uh, radiotherapy. And we know that when whole breast radiotherapy is given, the standard um, opposing tangential beams will end up uh, covering level one and level two of the axilla if we uh, adjust it accordingly. So where they're saying that patients have received no further treatment, they've probably, or uh, the, their axilla has, uh, they have, their axilla has been radiated, right? So is this local control and effect of the RT or is it because of the adjuvant systemic therapy? So a lot of controversies. So we can probably consider it. So this is the uh, ASBS statement, wherein they've said that we can possibly consider it in very early disease and not in patients where they have T3 tumors, that is more than five centimeters, uh, where there are more than two positive sentinel lymph nodes, patients undergoing mastectomy or patients undergoing partial breast radiation. 
Uh, the methylene blue dye, uh, it has certain side effects, right? It can cause allergic reactions in 1.6, it's 1.6. 1.6% uh, of the patients rarely can cause anaphylaxis. There's discoloration of the skin, which is a little unsightly. Uh, may cause skin necrosis, right? When injected uh, subdermally. And um, it is contraindicated in pregnancy. But the radio tracer uh, dye, the radio tracer uh, can be used in pregnancy. The various alternatives that have come up now for sentinel lymph node mapping, like super paramagnetic iron oxide, maxseed, uh, indocyanin green dye, which is now uh, it's quite popular in India, uh, hybrid spec, radioactive seeds, micro -bub bubbles, you know, a lot of things are being tried. So complications of sentinel lymph node biopsy and axillary lymph node dissection, like I mentioned previously, shoulder pain, impaired arm movements, numbness, lymphedema, all these side effects are much less, this morbidity is much less in the sentinel lymph node biopsy group as compared to the axillary lymph node dissection group, right? So uh, the Almanac trial, uh, wherein uh, they, this is again a randomized study, wherein they compared the arm and shoulder mobility and the quality of life uh, between the sentinel lymph node biopsy group and the axillary lymph node dissection group in clinically N0 patients. And uh, they saw like, I mentioned there was a lower incidence of arm morbidity in the sentinel lymph node biopsy group and improved quality of life. Uh, so just for completion's sake, I am going to mention the AMAROS trial, right? So this was another randomized control trial wherein they wanted to see whether um, axillary radiotherapy, right? They wanted to compare axillary dissection with axillary radiotherapy after positive sentinel uh, node biopsy in, the, uh, in breast cancer, right? So this, uh, this was a non-inferiority trial and they saw that there was no significant difference between the two treatment groups. So it was concluded that axillary RT is a valid treatment option compared to axillary lymph node dissection because the study showed us that the morbidity was much less with axillary radiotherapy. However, we still don't have the long-term data uh, of this, and uh, that is awaited. And uh, yeah, but axillary radiotherapy can be given uh, instead of a dissection. Uh, it's the call of the multidisciplinary team of your institute. Right, so I think that does it. Thank you so much. Uh, in case you all have any questions, um, I think uh, you all can ask me now or uh, you can email me, I will, uh, I will definitely revert. And uh, yeah, I'm open to suggestions. So, right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. It was a very wonderful talk. And uh, uh, Thank you, I, I, tried, I, I tried my best. Uh, it was quite extensive. Uh, yeah, so I, I hope you all understood. I, I do know that I hurried in some places. So I, um, you know, I understand if there are certain bits that you didn't understand and uh, feel free to reach out to me. Can you see my email? Yes, yes. ma'am, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so feel free to, uh, uh, you know, drop me a message, any feedback, anything at all. Any questions from anybody? There are questions in the chat box, ma'am. You can see them. Oh, just a minute. Oh, where is the chat box? You need to stop sharing your screen. Just a minute. Right, I actually haven't covered axillary reverse mapping in uh, this lecture. Uh, right, because I, I think this itself was uh, very extensive. Uh, what is the role of contralateral? Uh, one minute, screen sharing has stopped. What is the role of contralateral prophylactic mastectomy? Uh, so contralateral prophylactic mastectomy can be offered to those patients who, uh, you know, have... Uh, 
hereditary who have BRCA positive, maybe T, uh, P53 mutations, uh, we can offer them a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. Is there anything in particular uh, uh, with regard to that that you want to know, Dr. Mina? No, ma'am. And one more question, any trial regarding use of radiotherapy? Any trial regarding use of radiotherapy only without dissection of exit dissection? Any? Uh, any? I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. Did you ask me if we can uh, just give axillary RT without dissecting the axilla? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, yes, that, that is possible. That's, that's what I said. The Amaros trial has given us evidence, has uh, given us evidence uh, for the same, that uh, there is no difference in the overall uh, survival or the disease-free survival uh, if we give axillary radiotherapy um, uh, instead of an axillary dissection. And the morbidity is also much less. But like I mentioned, uh, a lot of it's, uh, it's still not the standard. I think people are uh, comfortable with an axillary lymph node dissection. And also we don't have long-term data for the same. We don't know uh, whether in the future we can um, expect any uh, uh, you know, side effects. So uh, we need to uh, wait and watch for more evidence. Okay, thank uh, you. Excellent talk. Uh, something else? uh wonderful presentation thank you thank you so much i really hope you guys liked it as medical oncologists when a patient comes to us post of the burning and pain in axilla sometimes a problem yes we prescribe pregabalin anything else that can be done is it expected to recover um it's actually very distressing i think more than more than 75 percent of the patients who come especially in big institutes right with the, the i do there is no trend of uh preserving the intercostal brachial nerve Right, so more often than not, patients come um, with this issue. Uh, there is one thing when we do cut the uh, intercostal brachial nerve, what textbooks describe uh, is in order to reduce some of this burning sensation, what we can do is cut the nerve, you know, a sharp cut um, right at the uh, ribs, right uh, at the chest wall, a sharp cut with the scissor, and not something hesitant, and definitely not with a cautery. Uh, but uh, despite doing all that, patients still have uh, this burning uh, sensation. Pregabalin is one option. Uh, we tell them to do exercises and that it will just reduce in time. In many patients, uh, in few patients, uh, you know, it's not controlled, it's quite severe. Then we actually send them to the uh, pain and palliative care clinic. Uh, but yes, I agree, it's uh, very distressing. It's very distressing. After BCS, if the margin shows DCIS, then what should be our next step? Right. So um, this is another, Dr. Bharat Kumar, right? So this is another area of controversy. Once following a breast conservation surgery, uh, if there is DCS, we need to see the extent of DCS. Is it just a small focus of DCS or is it, uh, you know, more extensive or is it, so that would uh, help us in guiding our decision. Um, if there's probably a very small focus on, of DCS, then we see the biology of the tumor. Uh, what is her, uh, you know, what is the grade of the tumor? Is it an earlier grade? What is her age? Um, you know, the, uh, the immunohistochemistry, is she hormone receptor positive? Is she hormone receptor negative? right? Uh, that should guide our decision. Of course, if there is more extensive DCIS, uh, then that will have to be excised. Uh, but then again, if there is only a focus of uh, DCIS, many surgeons uh, do not go and revise the margin because they believe that the uh, post-operative RT and the boost will take care of that. So uh, yeah, is, is that clear, Dr. Bharat? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Great, great. Uh, mm, so post NACT, BCS, what tumor removed pre-NACT or post? Uh, Dr. Navneet, I did not quite understand the question. Uh, ma'am, if a patient comes to the surgeon after taking a new adjuvant chemotherapy, so mm -hmm. if the uh, uh, 
we don't know about the uh, pre NACT status of the tumor. So what uh, if the B BCS has to be done? So how to proceed in that case? So you're telling me that a patient has come to you post uh, surgery. She's been operated elsewhere. Uh, no, ma'am. If a patient comes to the surgeon after chemotherapy, right? So the tumor has shrinked. So uh, in that case, if BCS has to be done, so what? No, no. Uh, post NACT, if a BCT has to be done, then a we need to know where the tumor was located and the extent of the tumor primarily. We need to see the pre-chemo mammogram. Secondly, the tumor should have been marked. So many centers, what they do is pre, uh, prior to the NACT, they place a clip, right? They place an ultrasound guided clip within the tumor. So even if the tumor uh, regresses, right? And the tumor, we know it does not regress uniformly, just does not uh, regress concentrically. It's a very Swiss cheese pattern of regression, right? Uh, it, can, it regresses in patches. But if the clip is there, that can guide us as to the excision. Uh, if the patient is somebody you have seen in your institute prior to chemotherapy, uh, what you can do is you can mark the center of the lesion. So what uh, I know the practice at Tata Memorial Hospital is they take, um, uh, so I was training there. So we would take a stitch at the um, center of the lesion. So every code biopsy that we used to do, we used to do it at the center of the lesion. So that has marked your center. So that would, that would scar. So post chemotherapy, we of course see the mammogram and if it has regressed, uh, that would guide us as to the location of the lesion. And then of course, after excision, we do send it for frozen section and uh, radiotherapy will cover it anyway. So uh, yes, but if the patient receives chemotherapy outside and then comes to you, uh, that's very tricky. That's very tricky, not advisable. But if you do have the pre-op imaging and you see that, you know, it was a very uniform tumor and a post-op, the post-NACT uh, mammogram, again, you see it's uniform. Maybe you can do an MRI for added information. If everything looks safe, maybe you can go ahead with it and keep your fingers crossed. But uh, yeah, with uh, complete informed consent of the patient. But that's tricky. If the patient is treated outside and then comes to you, very tricky. Uh, thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, you're welcome. Ma'am, mm. ma'am, can I ask you a question, ma'am? Yes, yes, please. Ma'am, ma'am, a patient treated outside from the periphery with a three centimeter lump, as a lumpectomy mm. has been done outside, and uh, the biopsy report showed uh, for uh, thinking it as a benign disease, uh, but the biopsy report showed it as a malignancy, and uh, the margins are clear in the histopathology report, and he mm. came to me, and I have seen that the there are no auxiliary nodes, uh, ultrasound also there is no not showing any auxiliary nodes. Do I have to do, uh, stage the axilla by doing axilla dissection or do I, can I give the radiation to the breast as a BCT? Uh, what is your take on that, ma'am? Without any uh, okay. axillary lymph node. Patient has undergone a wide local excision outside. No further yeah. treatment. They no thought further it treatment. was a benign disease. They've done a wide local excision and they come to you. But the histopathology mm -hmm. says it's malignancy. malignancy. And the margins are clear. Clear. Right? Yes. Are clear. You cannot yeah. go with radiotherapy. The axilla has to be staged. Has to be addressed. Breast cancer is incomplete without nodal treatment, without treatment of the regional lymph nodes. So the axilla will have to be addressed. In case there is no palpable axillary lymph node clinically, in case it's not detected on ultrasound, uh, what we can do is we can uh, do a sentinel lymph node biopsy and we can stage the axilla. Okay. okay. But is compulsory. Once your axilla staged and um, you don't suppose say if you need to go ahead with dissection great go ahead with dissection if not if it's n0 then you take a call and the, you'll have to anyway give whole breast um, radiotherapy yeah yes ma'am okay right. ma'am thank you clear clear ma'am thank you great great uh, right so what are the uh, dr sindhu reason behind recurrent seroma even after draining fluid <laughs> I was actually just discussing this uh, with uh, uh, my HOD the other day. Okay, so uh, what is, uh, Dr. Sindhu, uh, I, I would like you to answer this. What is a seroma? What is a seroma comprised of? Are you a surgeon, Dr. Sindhu? Or uh, 
Dr. Sindhu? Ma'am, actually, I'm a radiation oncologist. Okay. Could you please tell me uh, what do you think uh, the seroma comprises of? This is just a teething exercise, okay? Not, not anything else. So if you know it, great. If you don't know it, also, it's okay. Yeah. I don't know. Actually, maybe just fluid uh, post-operatively in the post-op character. I don't know exactly. Originally, it was believed that the seroma was only lymph. You know, when patients would come, they were told that, you know, you'll have some lymph accumulating there and don't worry and it will drain. But I recently read that it's not just lymph, but it's also, uh, uh, you know, the result of inflammation because of all that surgery that has been done. It uh, consists of a lot of inflammatory markers, right? So uh, recurrent seroma, again, um, a seroma will last for, say, 15, 20 days. And after that, it's uh, typically it reduces. Okay. Uh, in some patients, you know, who are uh, maybe very obese, uh, you know, it doesn't stop. It's prolonged and that interferes with wound healing. Um, what is the management? Honestly, you just keep aspirating the fluid. Uh, some centers, they put in um, CR, uh, CRD, they put in a corrugated drain or you can just reinsert the drain. Uh, despite that, if it still doesn't reduce, it's more than a month. Uh, you may try injecting talc. So, you know, like we do for pleurodesis, you can, uh, uh, you can dilute the talc in uh, distal water or uh, distal water and you can inject it. So that induces uh, an inflammatory reaction. And when you do this, it's also, uh, you know, you can maybe freshen the edges a little bit, uh, you know, so that induces an inflammatory reaction and causes the, uh, you know, the flaps to stick to the chest wall. Um, more recently, I have read a paper wherein they have described using uh, steroid injections, methylprednisolone, around 80 milligrams to uh, prevent a recurrent seroma. But in that particular paper, uh, apparently it was uh, uh, useful. It proved to be beneficial. It was a randomized control trial. So it was beneficial only in patients who had undergone a sentinel lymph node biopsy and not the axillary uh, nodal dissection group. That could be because uh, maybe patients with an axillary lymph node uh, dissection, there's a greater amount of dissection that we've done. So they may require a higher dose, but I don't have evidence for the same. Uh, but the same paper does state that uh, methylprednisolone has shown success to reduce uh, chances of seroma formation in other cancers, head and neck and things like that. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, how, we how do we decide on DCIS and margin intra-op as it's difficult to say on frozen section? Yes, that would be on final HPR only. What's your take on cavity shape? Cavity shape? Right. So yes, uh, very true. Uh, DCIS, uh, not that uh, it is definitely difficult on frozen section, but some people will be able to tell you that. Um, otherwise, it's seen on final HPR. Again, if uh, we see final HPR, uh, if we see DCIS uh, in the margin on final HPR, my answer remains the same. If it's focal, if it's only a focal deposit and the patient has very good biology, we can uh, treat it with just uh, radiation. But if it's more diffuse, extensive DCIS, then no, we have to go back in for a second procedure. Right? Did that, uh, Dr. Bharat, did that cover the first part of your question? Have I answered that? Okay, uh, moving on. Just let me know in case it's not clear. Yes, ma'am. What's your take on cavity shave in uh, BCS? Um, so more often than not, uh, what we do is we just do a wide local excision and uh, we send it, we orient it and we send the specimen for uh, margin assessment. Uh, however, recently when... Um, I had attended uh, a course uh, conducted by the European Surgical Society of Oncology and uh, there a lot of the experts had uh, from the UK, they had suggested that we routinely do a cavity shave. So what does a cavity shave mean? You do a wide local excision, right? The lump is excised. So the cavity that is there, the walls, so that goes for HPR. But for margins, we take additional shaves from all four margins and send it separately. Uh, they uh, recommended that uh, because it apparently it does make a difference uh, when the final HPR is being done. 
So probably um, a cavity shave is what is recommended. Yeah, uh, Dr. Maria, ma'am, uh, post WLE, how to do without the primary, how to stage? It can be done. I'm sorry, I, because of the paucity of time, I didn't go into the details of, uh, you know, the indications of sentinel lymph node biopsy. The sentinel lymph node biopsy can also be done post a wide local excision. Uh, so what do you do? You either uh, inject it around the, uh, the periareola, okay? But, uh, or you inject it around the site of the tumor. Yes, the lymphatics would have been distorted at that point in time, but we can attempt. Uh, there probably would be a higher rate of uh, false negativity. So what we can do is maybe instead of, if, if you probably see only one enlarged node or two, you probably take uh, one or two additional nodes and send it for HPR. But it can be done. It's not a contraindication. Clear? Maria? Uh, roll, uh, Dr. Salim. Roll of mastectomy versus upper outer quadrantectomy in... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I haven't understood your question. Dr. Salim? Yes, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Yes, yes. Tell me, Dr. Salim. Yeah, ma'am, I'm asking about a uh, patient with axillary node mats uh, with showing breast uh, tumor IAC markers positive uh, without any breast primary. Should we go for like, uh, after investigation? Is it, yeah. We should go okay. for upper outer quadrantectomy. Yeah. Mastectomy, yeah, whole breast radiotherapy. Actually, there are no, no. See, uh, we don't uh, upper outer quadrantectomy is out of the question because it's okay. again, uh, uh, you know, it's an unknown prime. Uh, say you don't have, you don't know where the primary is. It could be an axillary primary. It could be something occult, right? Okay. So in such cases, actually, where a lot of studies that have been done where they've compared uh, mastectomy versus a uh, uh, typical, uh, you know, conventional MRM versus axillary dissection alone. Uh, but a uh, lot of the evidence points to benefits if we do a uh, mastectomy as well. Upper outer quadrantectomy is out of the question because we don't know where the primary is. What if it's in the, you know, the medial aspect of the breast, right? Um, I would suggest in a setup like ours, we uh, do a mastectomy uh, along okay. with the axillary dissection. Okay, ma'am. Usually they say that the, the tumor usually most common site is the in the upper outer quadrant of the breast. So... Doing a upper outer quadrantectomy. No, but that's data. Exactly, that's, but... that's data. What is the point in doing an upper outer quadrantectomy? What if that has no disease and the disease is elsewhere? We don't know, right? Anyway, if it's going to be like an occult, uh, you know, like uh, if there's no disease in the breast, it uh, nothing turns up in the axilla. The I mean, on the ultrasound, the mammogram, you're going to do an MRI also. You have to do an MRI to see if there is uh, anything there at all. Doing an upper outer quadrantectomy, there's absolutely, I mean, it doesn't offer us anything. So we are neither here nor there, you know. We are neither sure that we clear the disease, but we want to sort of give her, uh, you know, make her feel that she has a breast. There's no point in that. Might as well do a mastectomy. If the patient is uh, very keen, uh, we can do a reconstruction. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you're welcome. Dr. Meena, inflammatory carcinoma of breast with pregnancy, how to plan for management. So uh, that's a separate topic, Dr. Meena. Uh, it's quite complicated management of um, CA breast in pregnancy. It depends on which trimester has the patient presented to you. Uh, again, inflammatory carcinoma of the breast, so she will have to receive uh, chemotherapy. If she's in the first trimester, we can definitely not give chemotherapy. Second trimester, third trimester may be considered Third trimester, again, no, it's around the time of labor. So second trimester, yes, you can consider giving radiotherapy and then plan the surgery. has to be a modified radical mastectomy. Plan for surgery after delivery and then go ahead with uh, adjuvant RT. Right? So it, it, uh, it uh, depends on uh, which trimester the patient uh, presents to you. If it's inflammatory carcinoma and very, very early stages of pregnancy. Depends again on the age of the patient. How many children does she have? Uh, is she keen on this pregnancy? You know, a lot of, lot of considerations that uh, you need to take into account. Yeah? Okay. Uh, right breast mass, left axillary nodal mm -hmm. mass. What is the choice of surgery? No. 
this is uh, so this is you're talking about m1 disease so if the disease in the right breast and uh, you have a contralateral axillary nodal mass then that is m1 that is metastatic right so in such cases we uh, uh, have to do a met workup and uh, a pet scan uh, okay and if there are no other sites of uh, mets right and it's only in the contralateral axilla then again this becomes oligometastatic breast disease so we uh, give her the traditional treatment you know chemo rt everything and uh, following uh, uh, following uh, everything we see the response of the contralateral axilla and if there are no other sites of mets okay no other there's no systemic disease at all then we can uh, do a clearance of the opposite axilla as well and consider radiation so that is the that is a possibility but if she you know she has a nodal mass in the contralateral axilla she has a mediastinal lymph nodes she has something you know small sitting in the liver no then you don't consider surgery at all we just go ahead with uh, palliative uh, chemotherapy okay how do we deal with non palpable uh, breast malignancy so non palpable breast malignancy so i'm guessing you're talking about screen detected malignancy uh, so we'll have to localize the lesion we'll have to localize the lesion with a wire or with some people uh, in the west they use those magnetic beads there are various ways to localize the lesion in india we most uh, commonly we use a wire we localize it we do a wide local excision and then sentinel uh, lymph node biopsy uh, which is standard and we treat it yeah is that clear dr pratibha I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, you're welcome. Mastectomy of right and lymph node dissection of left. No, no. So what I said was um, the disease is in the right, right? And you have a contr. You have disease in the opposite in the contralateral axilla. So that is metastatic disease. So that means the ipsilateral axilla also has to be addressed. so that would mean a modified radical mastectomy see this is a entirely different concept actually we are sort of veering off discussion so this is all what you are asking me is oligometastatic disease so in oligometastatic disease again uh, uh, we are uh, venturing into very controversial territory here so oligometastatic disease if uh, uh, you know if if we can achieve a complete clearance then uh, the metastatic deposit has to be treated so in the scenario that you given me she's got a disease in the right and she's got a contralateral axillary node so you treat the uh, you treat the disease right so you do a modified radical mastectomy of the right side which includes axillary dissection on the right and then we also do a lymph node dissection on the uh, contralateral axilla bilateral mrm not required you don't need to do a why do you need to remove the opposite breast as well if the opposite breast does uh, the you know there's something pops up later then you can address it you don't need to do it then it's oligomet systemic treatment no role of surgery no i do not agree with that dr bharat uh, oligometastatic disease is a totally different territory uh, right no the turkish paper talks about m1 disease uh the tmh and turkish paper is entirely uh, m1 disease okay metastatic so that's called the m1 paper right so in frank according to the tmh and the turkish papers if it is frank metastasis okay then there is no role for surgery oligometastatic disease is when the disease burden is low okay there uh, uh some papers say more than or you're making me <laughs> you're making me uh um go into something and en uh, entirely different anyway so this would be the last question okay and then you guys can probably uh, email me so oligometastatic disease is when there are more than uh, less than or equal to 3 uh, metastatic deposits okay and uh, some people say if more uh, more than or equal i mean less than or equal to 4 and more recently a few papers have said less than or equal to 5 a uh, very controversial territory but basically oligometastatic disease is low burden disease something that can be tackled like for example if you have something in the contralateral axilla you have uh, maybe you know a small spot in uh, the lung somewhere and that uh, you know, Resolves after chemo, 
then you can go ahead with treatment. You can consider uh, oligometastatic treatment. Surgery is definitely an option. But that is a discussion for another day. So Dr. Bharat, what you have, uh, what you have mentioned, that is the M1 paper. That is in frank metastasis. It's not oligometastasis. Yes. Dr. Bharat? All right. Um, anyway, so if we're done, right? No more questions. Uh, Y'all can message me. Okay, great, great, uh, Bharat. Fine, fine. So y'all can uh, drop me an email if you have further questions. Is that all right? Sure, ma'am. Uh, sure, ma'am. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me here. It was an absolute pleasure. I, I really enjoyed this session. Thank you, ma'am. And we look forward to more such sessions from, from you. Yeah, same here, same here. It was really nice. All right, see you all. And uh, take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay,